And it's a pleasure for me to be here, and even greater pleasure for me to be introducing our speaker today and to see so many of our students and members of the Office of Research and faculty members here also to listen to this very interesting presentation. From Richard Hewson, a professor of kinesiology um, and the Schlegel Research Chair in Vascular Aging and Brain Health. Professor Hugh Hewson is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. And the talk today is very interesting. It's about aging and how aging like changes in the cardiovascular system of astronauts who have spent long periods in space can inform our understanding of chronic disease here on Earth. So a major focus of his work has been the study of the ability of the cardiovascular system to regulate arterial blood pressure and brain blood flow in the elderly and in astronauts. Studying these two uh, populations in parallel provides some very interesting insights, as we will hear today, into uh, items such as what may increase the risk of fainting and falling in the elderly or in astronauts returning to Earth after long periods in space. His background uh, includes areas or places in terms of geography of the Earth that I have been to. So he has a Bachelor of Science in Physiology from Western University where I was Dean of Science for six years, a Master of Science in Physiology from the University of British Columbia. So previous to Western, I was out in BC for 22 years, and a PhD in Medical Science from McMaster University. So our geographies intersect very well. He has also authored two books and more than 200 publications in the field of cardiovascular and environmental physiology and aging. He's been the recipients of a long list of awards, and I won't go through them all, but I would like to draw your attention to three important ones. The Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology Honor Award in 1997, and two University of Waterloo Awards. The University of Waterloo Award for Excellence in Research in 2001, and the University of Waterloo Award for Excellence in Graduate Supervision in 2005. Um, excellent achievement. We're really excited to have you here, Professor Hugson, and very much looking forward to your talk. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Charmaine, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. So, um, what I'm going to do today is, as was just introduced, um, tell you a little bit about our spaceflight research and how it links in with the aging research that, that we've been doing um, over the last few years. Just a, a note about this slide, if, if there are any older faculty in the, in the crowd, you might recognize Howie Green down in the lower, lower left-hand corner there. But I think everyone will recognize uh, uh, Chris Hadfield over here, and uh, I'll show you a better picture of Danielle in a couple of minutes. Before I get started, though, I do want to give a special thanks to a good friend of mine, um, my lab technician for over 20 years, Dave Norley. Dave was always not only extremely skilled in terms of helping us maintain the highest possible standards in the lab, uh, but he was usually the first person to be tested um, back when he was young and healthy and fit and unfortunately over here where he also has heart failure. So everyone knows Chris Hadfield. Many of you might have been able to attend uh, when Chris did his uh, downlink from space and actually talked to us here at the University of Waterloo. Chris is a an adjunct professor at Waterloo, and he's come and done a couple of lectures for me in my undergrad class. But it was kind of Chris to say that he feels like an old man after getting back from space. So that's sort of the, the theme of our, our talk today. 
what have we learned from, from astronauts? What can it help us in terms of studying um, aging? Uh, we've looked at blood pressure regulation. We've measured arterial stiffness, looked at brain blood flow, and something else about insulin resistance, which is associated with the sedentary lifestyle. Um, we've done similar things in, in aging, as, as well as looking at heart failure and, and brain blood flow. How did we get into this? Well, we started with analogs of spaceflight. And the very first analog of spaceflight that we did back in the late 1880s um, was over in my lab. We bought a, a big sheet of 4x8 four, four plywood, stuck it slightly head down tilt, cut a chunk off the end actually, and we were able to raise it up so that it's just the right angle. That head down tilt is a simulation of space flight because it shifts the blood from the, the lower part of the body into the chest and the head. So we did four hour studies way back when. And as I say, we, we did those back in the late 80s. Um, I had a chance to do a sabbatical in France in Lyon, but also got involved in a 30-day bed rest study that was going on in Toulouse. We, as a group, went back to Toulouse in 2005. A couple of the people who were there with me um, are, are here. But we um, looked at 60 days bed rest in women. We had another study in 2010 uh, that was five days of bed rest with artificial gravity. In other words, you put them in a centrifuge and spin them around for a while as a simulation of being upright to see whether that had any benefits. And we have ongoing studies. This is the 60-day bed rest study. This was actually our very first subject out of, out of 24 women who spent 60 days in bed. Slight head down tilt. Notice the bedpan under the bed. They were in that position constantly, 24 hours a day. They went to the shower on a slight head down tilt plastic gurney, and that was the simulation of space flight. Half of them were lucky enough that they got to exercise every day. The other half just got to lie there. So it is certainly an extreme sedentary lifestyle. We've been involved in a number of uh, space flight studies, and I'm getting feedback from somewhere. Um, so we had a study that we called CSIS. CSIS was the first one that was looking at blood pressure regulation when people got back from space. We have another one called vascular. I'll show you some of the data from it in just a minute. Another one called blood pressure regulation, BP reg. We're in the middle of doing vascular echo right now, and we are just starting on vascular aging. So we've had quite an opportunity to, to, to do different things with spaceflight. Well, why did we get, why were we concerned about blood pressure regulation? Up at the top here, Chris is catching one of the American astronauts, uh, Heidi Marie Stefanish and Piper, who, standing up at a press conference the day after she landed on a, on a shuttle like that, um, you can see she's turning a little bit green. And they put her down for a while, they stood her back up, and the next time she really went down. So there was a, that this happens fairly frequently because you take away gravity, the body sort of forgets in a way how to, how to respond to gravity. A number of things start to change and it's those changes that we were trying to capture. So as I said, our very first study was, was the Project CSIS. And here's our very first astronaut, Clay Anderson. So this is back 10 years ago. Um, this is, if any of you have ever gone to Johnson Space Center in, in Houston and, and had a chance to do the tour, you get to walk along a, a balcony up here, you look down and there's a big mock-up of the International Space Station. And inside this capsule, or this module right here, is all of this equipment. So here I'm just showing Clay how to put on the, uh, the blood pressure cuff onto his finger. You can see he's got electrodes on for measuring his heart rate for 24 hours. And he's also got a, a wrist watch that, that's an ACTA watch, measures how, how physically active they are during that 24 hours. Now, I can't go off on a lot of side trips here, but I'll tell you this one. We were doing our very first experiment, and Danielle was in the office talking to the people in Houston who were then talking to the astronaut. The astronaut went to the drawer 
it would not open. He tried again. It would not open. After a while, he went for some tea. And the Houston people talked to Danielle and said, well, can he do the experiment without the equipment? <laughs> so the answer is no, obviously. But <laughs> fortunately, he came back from his tea break and the drawer opened. Something had floated up and locked the, you know, sort of barred the way in. But anyway, so we were, we've been to Houston many times. We were there three times this past month for um, some pre- and post-flight testing on astronauts. Um, we've also been to Russia quite a few times. Uh, this is in Star City, which is just outside of Moscow. Uh, this is actually Bob Thirsk, the first Canadian long-duration astronaut. Um, here's Danielle with uh, hooking up the and measuring the carbon dioxide that he's breathing out. And our friend and colleague Philippe Arbe from France, um, who, who continues to work with us on these uh, research projects. And we're at the Kennedy Space Center. Kennedy Space Center, they, they'd land on the shuttle, and they'd keep them flat. They'd put them on a gurney, and they'd roll them into, into the lab here. We'd roll them off the gurney straight onto the bed. They'd never been upright before they did the experiment with us. So you'd think that that would really allow you to see how poorly their blood pressure is regulated, right? Well. Let me show you the next graph with a little bit of data on it. This on the left-hand side is one of our bed rest studies in our lab here, four hours of bed rest. The, you can see the arterial blood pressure is starting to go down. This, this is lower body negative pressure. Remember in this previous graph here, these boxes, what we do is we hook a vacuum cleaner up to them with a rheostat so we can apply progressive levels of suction. So it's, it's sort of the same as tilting them, but it gives us other advantages, which is why we use that. Anyway, as you apply a little bit more and more suction, the amount of blood going back to the heart drops, blood pressure starts to fall off, and you can see heart rate here is higher after the four hours of bed rest than it is before the four hours of bed rest. This is what happens with six months in space. Absolutely nothing to the heart rate, nothing to blood pressure, and the venous return or the pressure of blood coming back to the heart is unchanged. We thought, well, maybe it's because they're doing lots of exercise now and they're not fainting the same way that they were before. That's a possibility, but we still haven't really resolved it. Point is, they, I, I, I think compared to when they were on these short duration shuttle flights, the woman I sh showed you a second ago who was fainting, She'd been on short duration shuttle flight. And they have a, you know, a really, really busy schedule. So they're really stressed while they're up there. They come back and they're you know, quite out of it. These guys, though, get into a regular routine. They do lots of exercise. They you know, have fairly good nutrition and, and so on. So, so all, of, all of those things combined seem to bring them back, for the most part, healthier. I'll show you a graph later where at least one of them didn't. Anyway, this is one of our astronauts in the CESA study, Mike Fink. This is seven hours after he hit the ground in Russia. Um, they put them on a helicopter, fly them to an airport, fly them to the um, airport that's right near Star City. They bring them over, and as you can see, the military band is playing in the background and, and so on. But he does not look like he just got back from seven months in space, or six months in space. OK, so we've sort of given up on blood pressure side a little bit. Um, we're still looking at it. But one of the other things that we're interested in is what happens to arterial stiffness. The reason that we're interested in this, this is me standing here right now. Okay, Blood pressure at the heart about 100, blood pressure up in the head about 70. So the hydrostatic column here reduces blood pressure as, as you go up. You go into space, you get rid of that hydrostatic column. Blood pressure is now the same in the head as it is in the heart. So the head and the neck region are relatively hypertensive compared to what they are most of the time on Earth. If you develop hypertension, your blood vessels are going to get thicker and stiffer. So we figured that that should happen as well with the astronauts. As well, they become very physically inactive overall. And there are things happening to their hormone, hormones and their 
um, insulin responses that I'll show you. So we have reason to believe that that's what's going to happen. There's good evidence from the ground. These are, an, are arteries from, uh, from an animal model where they elevate the blood pressure in the head. And you can see from the control condition to this uh, elevated pressure condition, this is the wall of the artery. It gets a lot thicker. And you can see down here the same thing from a, a different research lab. So when Danielle and I are trying to measure the carotid artery stiffness, she's on one side with the ultrasound device. You can see the screen over here. You can see a little bit of pulsatility on that. That black area in the middle is the blood. And then the whiter bands are the, are, are the artery um, expanding and contracting. You know, put your fingers on your carotid arteries. You feel them pulsing. Okay, That's exactly what we're measuring with the, with the ultrasound there. And I've got a pressure transducer on this side to measure what the pressure is. Okay, So we put those bits of information together, and we calculate the distensibility of the, of the arteries. OK, so the next slide, just look at the right-hand side first for a second. OK, so this is going from age 45 up to age 85. So here we have the distensibility getting reduced, or they are stiffer. These are our astronauts over here. And we happen to get four women and four men in this, this study, which is very unusual. Um, these are pre-flight values. And these are post-flight values. So the amount of stiffness increase that you see here is the same as about 10 to 20 or so years of aging equivalent. Now, it's not the same mechanism, but it's the going in that direction. We think it's mostly that hypertension. It could be something to do with the physical inactivity causing some changes and maybe some hormonal things happening as well. But not only are the arteries stiffer, the walls get thicker. So these are from our friend in, in France, Philippe. Um, you can see that this is the thickness of the wall, and it increases in all of the astronauts when they go into space. And it stays a little bit elevated when they come back from space. OK, this is just a slide to sort of remind me that we also did some blood, brain blood flow measurements on, on these people. And what we're doing here is we're giving a little bit of carbon dioxide to uh, Bob Thirsk because it causes the brain blood vessels to dilate, and we see how efficient they, they are. But one of the, the things that's become a major issue with astronauts on the International Space Station is that they're starting to develop vision problems. And one of the major hypotheses behind that is that you're having too much blood pressure in, in the head, and that sort of from the back of the head uh, flattens the eyeball a little bit. They do have some nice um, uh, CT images of the, of the flatter eyeball and twisted optic nerves and, and so on. So one of the things that could be causing that is the elevated carbon dioxide. And we measured this in space. Um, this is what happens normally as you expire. Your carbon dioxide goes up, and then it comes back down. This is when the person's on the ground. This is when the person's in space. So that's a pretty big increase, actually, in the amount of carbon dioxide that's in, in the lungs and in, in the body. And that should cause a big increase in brain blood flow. It doesn't, and we don't know why just yet. Our experiment wasn't specifically designed to, to go after that. OK, I talked about physical inactivity. So we were actually the first ones to quantify how active the astronauts were over a day. So down at the bottom here, this is ankle activity counts. So as people get up and they walk to the next building or you know whatever, or they go for a run, you get all these bursts of, of ankle activity. And most of those are associated with bursts of heart rate. So this is how we stay fit, by going for a run, elevating our heart rate, making that heart muscle work. Okay? So when they're in space, they can still make the heart rate go up like that. But this actually was a, a cycle ergometer uh, study. That's why you don't see as big a blip down here. But notice the rest of the day, they're just floating around, right? They're not having to work against gravity, not climbing stairs. So you don't have these big bursts, and you also don't have the as many frequent bursts of heart rate 
So you take away that constant within a day stimulus that's going to um, help maintain your physical fitness. Now, have, have any of you heard an astronaut or someone talking about astronauts say, I exercise for two and a half hours per day? Has anyone heard that? Other than Daniel. <laughs> okay. Chris came and did a lecture for me last year, and one of the things he said was, we exercise for two and a half hours per day. After the class, I said to Chris, I don't think that's quite right, because we actually have your data. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure which one of these he is, but this is the total aerobic exercise time per day averaged over their space flight. It's half an hour of aerobic exercise per day. So if you lie in bed for 23 and a half hours and get, get up and exercise a bit on a treadmill or a cyclogometer, more than likely you're going to become less fit than you were before you went into that routine. Right? They also do resistance exercises, but you know, that doesn't do quite the same thing. One of the things we know well from Earth now is that sedentary time is strongly associated with cardiometabolic biomarkers. In other words, development of insulin resistance. Okay? And it's really important to break up sedentary time. So that half hour of exercise at the gym in the morning, then sit at your computer the rest of the day, not so healthy. You need to do more frequent periods of physical activity. All right, so in our, in our astronauts, we were able to take some blood samples. This is Jeff Williams, who had just taken his blood and then put it in the centrifuge. They spin, spin it down in the centrifuge, put it in the minus 80 freezer, and eventually it ends up landing somewhere, um, most recently in the Pacific Ocean. And then it gets FedExed back to our lab here and stays in the freezer until we have a chance to, to process the data. So these are the fasting insulin concentrations before flight and in flight. Notice every single astronaut, male and female, has an increase. And this is an insulin resistance index based on this fasting blood glucose. Every single astronaut has an increase in insulin resistance as a consequence of space flight. Now, I mentioned the study BP-REG, blood pressure regulation. So this is the very first experiment that we got to do, and Chris was our very first subject for it. So he's hooked up here with a blood pressure device on his finger, and then we put these leg cuffs around the upper parts of the thigh. Those leg cuffs are inflated for three minutes. There's no blood flow into the leg for three minutes. So when we rapidly release these, you get a big rush of blood flow into the, into the legs. You get a big drop in blood pressure. And it's like standing up in space. Because if you stand up right now, your blood pressure is going to drop. If you get out of bed in the morning, you get a bigger drop. Okay? So we thought we'd be able to use this to try and detect whether or not people are having impaired blood pressure regulation. Turns out that probably didn't work out the way we expected it to at least in part because we had nine people, nine men in this study. Six of them were experienced jet fighter pilots. And when we did their post-flight stand test, there were only a couple of them looked like this. So this is before they, he went into space. This is lying down. Sit up, you get a tra transient drop. Stand up, you get another transient drop, but then you know blood pressure is pretty well maintained as he stands there for three minutes. Coming back from space, now you get a huge drop when he sits up, another drop here, and you notice that if we'd left him standing for another minute or so, he probably would have been falling down. So the, but this was you know, two guys out of nine who responded this way. So it doesn't seem that there's quite as big a problem with blood pressure regulation. But there are also ways around it, so you can put compression garments on them and, and so on, which might assist and further reduce the risk of blood pressure. NASA's sort of written blood pressure off as a, a risk factor anymore. All right, so we're also 
um, as I said, currently doing a study that's called vascular echo. And one of the key things about vascular echo is that we're actually trying to measure the, the, what's happening to the arteries and the, the heart and you know, sort of the circulatory system while they're in space. So we do what's called remote guidance ultrasound. So the astronaut here is holding the probe against his own carotid artery. Uh, the ultrasound machine is just over here and he has to push buttons and so on. We are in our next uh, measurement, which should be happening in January next year. We're going to be using this probe, which is robotically controlled, so that we can sit on the ground, manipulate the with a fictive probe, and actually control the all the keys from the keyboard, and monitor what's going on as the image or as we acquire the image. So we don't need the astronaut who sometimes, you know, we. <laughs> We have this little um, maneuver that we call a sweep, which should be you put the ultrasound probe here and you go like that. Okay, well, some people sweep like this. <laughs> it, it's, it's not easy to convey all the time what you want the astronaut to do. So, I mean, Danielle is, is really good. This is us sitting over here in, the, uh, um, in our lab over in the, the Research Institute for Aging. We actually sit and talk. This is the NASA um, communications device, so I can actually listen in on all of the conversations that are happening. Danielle is the only one who's authorized to talk to the astronaut. Uh, she, she watches the ultrasound screen, so she knows what's going on there. What's out of sight just above me here is actually the cabin view. So we get to watch the astronaut doing things, so we know he's got the probe on his neck and not on his stomach or you know whatever. Um, and so she tells the astronaut exactly how to position the probe, which buttons to be pushing, and so on. This was our trial run. Um, the ultrasound that we're about to use was actually up in, in Montreal. Um, so this is Montreal up here. You notice that screen there is exactly what Danielle has here. So she's able to control the ultrasound in this way. So we've got um, these, this new um, a, approach, which we hope is going to give us a lot better um, information. So, go ahead. So, we got to turn the, the volume up. Not that high. <laughs> okay. So, I'm, yeah. All right. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a video. Uh, Tim Peake was the first astronaut who took part in vascular echo. Hi, I'm Tim Peake, and welcome on board the International Space Station. Whilst we're on Earth, we don't realise how important the pull of gravity is to our overall health. Up here in space, because we're floating, we have to exercise daily to limit the impact on our cardiovascular system. In space, the changes to our heart and our blood vessels are quite striking. Did you know that during a six-month space mission, an astronaut's cardiovascular system can age by up to 10 or 20 years? This surprising discovery was made by Professor Richard Hewson, a Canadian scientist at the University of Waterloo. With the help of the Canadian Space Agency, Professor Hewson is currently working on an experiment called Vascular Echo. This is his fourth study on board the International Space Station. Vascular Echo examines changes in the heart and blood vessels whilst astronauts are in space, and it monitors their recovery when they return to Earth. A chronic increase in blood pressure in our head and our neck whilst in space can result in stiffer arteries. Changes in our cardiovascular system might also reflect other risk factors, including the overall reduction in levels of physical activity as we float in space. This can result in insulin resistance, which is a cause of type 2 diabetes on Earth. Nine astronauts will take part in vascular echo by providing blood samples and taking ultrasounds of their arteries before, during, and after their missions to space. The knowledge we gain from vascular echo could help to keep astronauts healthy in space, and it could also benefit people on Earth, especially those who are sedentary, the elderly, or bedridden patients. Okay, 
so Tim said it much better than I can say it. Um, we, we actually, this past Monday, we were in Germany and did our one-year post-flight measurement on, on Tim. So he's the very first person, first of our astronauts we've actually been able to follow up because the study I showed you previously um, that, that increased arterial stiffness was measured essentially you know, about 36 hours after they got back from space. We don't know if how, you know, how long it takes to recover or if it recovers. It's a possibility it doesn't, but we, it's highly unlikely. So anyway, so we're, we're doing the, the, the vascular echo study as a, as a follow-up. Because of the vascular study where we saw that increased um, insulin resistance, we put another proposal forward. And the study is being called vascular aging. We've finally gotten the, the funding started a couple of months ago. And what we're going to be doing is actually measuring the, an oral glucose tolerance test in space. That insulin resistance index that I showed you a little while ago is really not very sensitive. Um, one of our colleagues, Martina here from, from Germany, who's a collaborator on, on this study, um, did a bed rest study. So people in bed for 21 days, they're obviously going to decondition. And you get quite a big change in the blood glucose response here, showing you know, pretty huge insulin resistance. Martina did not see a change in that other index that we found changed. So it will be really interesting to see, given the fact that we saw a change in that resting insulin resistance index, what's going to happen to their oral glucose tolerance test. So we'll also, though, be using a couple of, uh, well, we have the potential of using a couple of Canadian devices. One, um, some of you who do fitness might know about this Astro Skin. It's a vest that you can wear that monitors heart rate and respiration and activity levels. Um, they've modified it for space. We probably won't be using the analyzer for doing blood, uh, blood analysis in space. OK, so over the past 10 years, we've gotten to know 30 astronauts uh, who took part in our research projects. So right from Clay, our first guy, through Bob and Chris, and uh, where's Tim? There's Tim Peake again. So as, you know, as, as we sort of introduced at the beginning of this talk, um, some of this transfers over, in, over into our studies of aging. And so we can go on and ask, well, what are the consequences of stiffer arteries with aging? And I told you to feel your carotid arteries a little while ago. If you're 25 year old, every time your heart beats, you're going to get an expansion of the artery like this. Okay? And you're going to have a nice thin wall on the, on the artery. So this gray line through the black to the bright white, um, that's referred to as the intermedia thickness, which is strongly related with the, the risk for cardiovascular disease. So by the time you get to 85, your arteries don't expand very much. You got a thicker wall. This little quotation up here, actually William Osler was a Canadian physician. So what's the consequence of having stiffer arteries? This is part of the, uh, of the Framingham study down here. If you have stiff arteries, the probability of having a major cardiovascular event is much greater than if you have nice, flexible arteries. What we found a couple of years ago was that if you have stiff arteries, the resistance to blood flow into the brain increases. And of course, if the resistance to blood flow into the brain increases, you're going to get less brain blood flow. So we have some people who have only about a third of the blood flow of some of the other people. These are all seniors over 65 up to about 90 or so. So you get a, you know, this reduction in brain blood flow. What's the conse consequence of stiff arteries, reduction of brain blood flow? Well, this figure was published a couple of years ago. Increased arterial stiffness leads to an increase in pulse pressure, which damages the small vessels in the, in the brain, which reduces brain blood flow, which can cause brain atrophy, cognitive, loss of cognitive function, and cognitive impairment, and if I'd left the last box on over here, potentially Alzheimer's. 
The other thing that's come fairly recently out of the Framingham study is that there's a relationship even in young to middle-aged adults to the cognitive function. So we've been doing studies with, uh, with older participants looking at the brain oxygenation and uh, the brain blood flow, measuring blood pressure in them. And my PhD student, uh, Laura Fitzgibbon, has measured um, here a fairly, fairly large number, getting close to 80 older adults who come from the Schlegel villages. There's a group who maintain their cerebral oxygenation pretty well. And then there's a subgroup, about 20% you know, or so of the population, that has a bigger drop in, in the oxygenation levels. These people who have good oxygenation to the brain when they get up out of bed and stand, they're nice and stable. The other people down here, though, there's a lot more wobble. And this is fairly consistent. These are only one, one, peop, one person in, in each of these um, pictures here. But it's fairly consistent. So that's one aspect of, of brain blood flow and, and brain health. Another aspect, uh, Diane Moros has collected data looking at what happens going between rest, walking at usual pace, climbing stairs. And we have this ambulatory monitor. You saw it a second ago. So it, we can walk around with this thing and you know, go pretty well anywhere we want. If you measure the amount of brain flow under the curve here, compare it to here, you get more brain blood flow when you're walking. So that part of it's healthy. And of course, if you combine that with other things like doing mental tasks while you're walking, then you go with even a little bit higher. Now, I said a while ago that we were also studying um, people with heart failure and what happens to the oxygenation levels. And this is what happens. So this is the sort of the basal level of oxygenation. And person with heart failure has a drop, and especially if the person is walking a little bit faster, there's an even bigger drop. So this drop off in the, in the cerebral oxygenation is really important. Heart failure patients, almost all of them are going to have some degree of cognitive impairment. That cognitive impairment is probably a consequence. What, what's hidden in behind here is that the heart failure patients, because these are all normalized for that, in that person, okay? If we didn't normalize but we left them as absolute numbers, the heart failure patient would be down here below the person without heart failure. Uh, Caitlin Fraser, who did a master's uh, project on this, um, showed that when you, you know, when, if you measure them when they're lying down, which is what everyone had done up until that point, Heart failure patients have lower brain blood flow. You get them to sit up, and they drop even more below the, the normal value. So definitely brain blood flow in heart failure patients. They, they're able to regulate blood pressure, but they just don't have enough blood to keep pumping it up to the, the top of the head and, and, and uh, feed the brain properly. Now, also on this graph, you notice this big spike here? Well, that's what happens. Um, in a, quotes, control person who goes from lying down to standing directly. Now, that control person happens to be me, so if we, have, if we want to study this thing, phenomenon called initial orthostatic hypotension, we've got a, a very prime candidate to, to take a look at that. And I see Robert smiling here because he needs people who have that big drop in blood pressure for, for his studies. Okay, so that brings me sort of to the, the end of, of what I wanted to say, other than to say thank you for all, to all the, uh, the sponsors and my biggest supporter, <laughs> my wife Nadia down there in the corner. So that's on our trip to Ireland last year for a conference and an opportunity to meet with the, uh, um, the, the people at, in Dublin who are um, who are involved in the, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, and we're hoping to get some neat collaborations going there this year. So anyway, I'd be happy to answer some questions. So let's thank Richard first.
Thank you, Richard. So I was interested to see the increase in thickening amongst astronauts because that seems to happen relatively quickly. And you said you think their pressure, uh, their stiffness will reduce. Do you think the thickening will reduce? And do you ever see reduction of thickening in normal people, I guess, addressing aging through exercise? Okay, the, the, there are two parts of that, right. that question. Um, the, the answer is we expect the thickening to, to be reduced. It, it's a pressure thing, and we know from the, I cut a panel off that animal study. There was one other one there where they put them, lowered their blood pressure in the head for a longer you know, a period of time each day, and that got rid of the, the hypertrophy. Um, in, in terms of aging, though, the arterial stiffness is a consequence of, of several things, one of which is probably oxidative stress. So the oxidative stress reduces the amount of nitric oxide that's, that is released, which nitric oxide is a vasodilator. There, uh, there's a group in Colorado, Doug Seals group, that has looked quite extensively at countermeasures for that in aging, and physical exercise helps, and they're also looking quite intently right now at nutraceuticals that are able to allow better production of nitric oxide, reduce oxidative stress. Thank you, Richard. A very interesting and exciting talk. Now, I have to confess two things. First of all, my quest to find the fountain of aging becomes more intense as each year goes by. Find the <laughs> fountain of youth, not yes, fountain I would, of aging. Yes, I, I was thinking you and, probably found the I, fountain of aging. Like and all I, of us. I, came in, I came into this talk uh, thinking that gravity was a problem because when I run up hills now, I often think to myself, I wish, it, I, wish I didn't have to cope with gravity. So you have shattered that illusion very strongly, <laughs> unfortunately. Artery stiffening is, is interesting, and, and it's clear that it's uh, an important phenomenon. And, and I can't help but think, or let me say it this way, I, let me ask you the question. Much of what happens at the tissue level is a reflection of what happens at the cellular level, right? And just as arteries stiffen as people age, biological membranes, cell membranes, also dramatically lose fluidity. That's been demonstrated time and time again. Some of our own earlier work demonstrated that. And accompanying that is loss of um, membrane function, in particular um, mitochondrial activity, which generates uh, energy, ATP. And accompanying that as well is a large increase in the production of free radicals, superoxide, for example, which causes all kinds of damage and contributes to cell aging. So that's a roundabout way of getting to my question. My question is, what happens at the cellular level? in astronauts. Uh, is there a change in mitochondrial activity uh, related to energy production? And are there any changes in the production of free radicals, in particular superoxide, which are known to increase during natural aging? Okay, let, let me answer the last one first and then work out our way backwards. We tried to look at um, total oxidative stress levels from markers in the blood, we didn't see anything. Um, it, it's interesting, everyone hypothesizes that that's what's gonna happen. The reality from ground-based bed rest studies is that we, we use a technique called flow-mediated dilation to try to look at whether or not there's an increase in free radical uh, production which causes less nitric oxide and less dilation. You actually get greater dilation in the people who have bed rested, which is certainly counterintuitive. We don't know about, we don't know about astronauts, so let me come back and, and answer your question a little bit more. The, there's a huge interest from NASA in terms of, of what's happening from the omics perspective. Um, the uh, the, in the, the so-called twin study where one twin was in space and the, the other one was on the ground. 
um, that's really the first time that they've applied full um, range of omics techniques. Um, I've not seen the answers yet. Um, if we talk only skeletal muscle mitochondria, I can tell you that a number of studies have been, have been done there with short duration astronauts. You can maintain um, oxidative capacity reasonably well if they're exercising. If they don't exercise, no. Um, there's a study, uh, Dieter Blotner from Berlin is, is doing biopsy studies right now. Uh, we haven't seen his results yet. So that's, that's the problem with space is that, you know, every one of those studies that I described up there, from writing the proposal to being able to submit manuscripts is 10 years. Lots of money. And lots of money, exactly. <laughs> They want the mic, though, for the, the audio. <laughs> um, again, thanks a lot for the talk. They're always great to hear. Um, my question is about the insulin resistance study. Um, it would, obviously, it uh, would be great to see all the OGTT scores. But um, we know that insulin resistance is influenced by a number of factors. One of them is physical activity. Another one would be diet. Is that something that's been controlled in those studies that look at insulin resistance in astronauts? Well, we're the only ones who've actually reported the insulin resistance based on fasting values. We did not control what they ate the night before. They were just overnight fasted. Um, for this study, we will control what they eat the day before. The, the other part of the, not exactly what you asked, but l let me tell you, um, we had a chance, one of our uh, astronauts was Tom Marshburn, who's a medical doctor, and I talked to him after he'd gotten back from space, and he said he's been trying very, very hard to convince people that they should not be supplementing their total caloric intake by drinking Tang or equivalent. So astronauts drink a fair bit of glucose, sugar solutions, just simply because they need to keep up their caloric intake. So diet, I'm sure, has a role. Uh, thanks for giving your talk, first of all. Um, so you mentioned um, on a couple occasions that the, the um, arterial wall thickness and um, uh, its stiffness too, uh, it's equivalent to a dramatic increase in aging for the post-flight as opposed to the pre-flight. Um, but you expect it to go down over time. Um, that being said, are there any long-term implications for the astronauts with this? And if so, what are they? Yeah, the, the long-term implications, I mean, we don't know for sure that these reverse. Um, the, the other, let me bring one other thing in, into play here, which I've not mentioned at all, and that's radiation. Um, we actually, with some, uh, some colleagues in Italy, we just have a, an article about to appear in uh, Nature Reviews Cardiology that will go through the, dis the, the details of the radiation effects. There's probably enough um, contribution from that when you combine it with some of the things that we are seeing that maybe it is significant. Um, there's another study that was published by a, a friend of mine from Florida and he did some, some, some analysis, admittedly, on an extremely small sample, those people who have gone be, beyond low Earth orbit. Because in low Earth orbit, they're still reasonably protected from uh, the cosmic radiation. 
but once you get beyond low Earth orbit, you now have the potential for these high energy uh, radiations to, to impact. He saw in that really small group of people a higher incidence of coronary artery disease and death um, than in the normal population and certainly in the healthy cohort of other astronauts who had not gone beyond low Earth orbit. Now, there are some people who are extremely upset that he got those data published um, because, you know, you, it's a really small sample size and some people don't think that they would have gotten enough radiation to have caused that effect. Um, so, it's still something to be looked at. In, in terms of, um, you know, the, the thing that NASA and you know, um, Elon Musk and others are, are looking at is sending people to Mars. Mars has a reduced, at, reduced gravitational field. So, not only does it take you a really long time to get there at zero gravity, but now you're going to be in reduced gravity for a long period of time. You're probably going to be in a reduced physical activity state throughout pretty well that whole time, especially travel, because they haven't figured out really yet how to put this little tiny exercise device that's going to allow you to exercise as much as you need into the little tiny capsule that's going to go there. Right. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk today. Um, my quick question is, after an astronaut uh, goes into uh, um, space, we see an increase in blood pressure leading to an increase in arterial stiffness in a superior artery. Have we seen any um, uh, tissue changes in the uh, lower extremities? Uh. Yeah, um, really good question. The bottom half of the slide I didn't talk about up there was the femoral artery intermediate thickness, and it increased just about as much as the carotid artery did. We don't know why. Um, because if you go back to my proposal for this study where we found the increased stiffness, we expected there to be a reduction in stiffness in the lower part of the body. We also have data for transit time, which is a surrogate for how stiff the vessels are. That also indicates that the vessels from here down to there are stiffer, um, which doesn't make a lot of sense from a blood pressure perspective. But maybe that's where you start coming into the physical inactivity and the, you know, change, the hormonal changes that are happening. Um, you know, some of the hormones that are, that are elevated can cause increased arterial stiffness and hyperplasia of the vessel walls. And, and so on. So, so there's still lots of other possibilities that are going in there, which is why I sort of you know, don't say clearly that, oh, yes, they're going to recover. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, so we'll take one final question. <laughs> Got one over here. So you talked about the kind of um, artificial hypertension created by the lack of gravity. Um, I'm wondering about actually taking off from Earth, and it's something like three Gs of, of um, acceleration on, on the astronauts for like a relatively lengthy period, right? Yeah, well, um, the shuttle's eight and a half minutes. Do you know if that matters, or does, um, is that a confounding effect in, in all of this? In, in the long term, no. In the short term, um, first of all, they're on their back with their feet up. So if, if anything, it's pushing blood into the central circulation. So they've, they've actually had um, three American astronauts launch with a catheter coming into the right side of the heart to measure the, the blood pressure. Their central venous pressure does increase a fair bit during the launch period, but immediately on going into space, boom, down to almost zero. So it's actually lower when they're in space than, it's probably about the same as when I'm standing, but it's certainly lower than what you get when you're lying down. But it's a relatively short period of time, so it's not going to have a huge impact. I get a chance to 
talk with you after. So, uh, I'd like to take first the opportunity to thank once more Richard for such an interesting talk. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you.